Good afternoon. My name is Victoria Eshbach Sabo from Tokyo College at Tokyo University. And I have the pleasure to welcome you at today's lecture. Our research topic is the modern key concept, identity, being in politics or in people's everyday life. Discussing the connection of language and identity is the strength of our group as identity is we try to consciously observe it in different language roles. It is an extraordinary pleasure to welcome Professor Sadanobu Toshiyuki from Kyoto University at our lecture series. The first time I have heard his name was in Tübingen at my Japanese department quite some time ago. Then Professor Kudo Mayumi from Osaka University was visiting us as Erwin von Belt's fellow. She told us that Professor Sadanobu from Kobe University at that time is a great hope for Japanese linguistics. Professor Sadanobu takes no a particular passion to think and to publish about theoretical questions in cognitive linguistics and to verify new theories using written and spoken data from Japanese and from other European and non-European languages like Chinese, Korean also. His extraordinary competence in collecting data in international projects and the developing concepts is fascinating for the international linguistic community. Furthermore, Professor Sadanobu is not only addressing scientists with books like Ninchi Gengo Gaku, Cognitive Linguistics, but he is also able to express his thoughts in a popular way. His book, for instance, I want to show you one book, Sasayaku Koibito, Rikimu Repota, Uchi no Naka no Bunka, Whispering Flowers and report a stone or voice, the culture in our mouths, published 2000, is showing us how to communicate emotions and present facts in Japanese. Because of his passion to explain things in an enjoyable way, he has many fans also at his linguistic blog at Senseido Publishing House. We invited him because his outcome concerning our specific topic, language and identity, has been extraordinary. Today's lecture is focusing the actual development of a new semiotic concept in Japanese linguistics, which is used in creating a person and structuring communication through language in personal and social contexts called kiara from Kyarakteru, or character in English. The title of his lecture is Identity and Kyara. In addition to his lecture, a project researcher from Ohio University, new at Tokyo College, Hannah dahlberg Dodd, a specialist of social cultural linguistics, popular media and semiotics, will comment it and ask questions. Let me now hand over to Professor Sadanobu for his lecture. Sensei, onegai shimasu. Thank you very much, Professor Ishibaku Sabo. I would like to begin by uh, saying that I am a great I'm grateful for the opportunity to present this lecture. The title of my lecture is Identity and Kara. Uh, Kara is a concept that originated in Japan and is one of my main research topics. Uh, I will introduce it in detail later. Let's start by reviewing the previous research concerning identity and Kara through now. Uh, many years have passed since it first was pointed out that 
uh, in the contemporary world, it is not easy for young people to establish what Eric H. Erickson called ego identity. The situation is largely is the same in Japan, but in Japan, the concept of Kara has been introduced to this discussion. For example, the sociologist Takayoshi Dori has argued that the young people of today are not seeking a unified image of themselves or their uh, ego identity, but instead they base their own image on a mixture of various fragmented and pluralistic Kara according to the circumstances. In addition, the philosopher Yuichiro Okamoto argues that in contemporary Japan, Kara is even more important than identity. So what does Kara refer to? Uh, let's consider three types of the word Kara. The first of these is the shortened word of character, the foreign long word from the English word character, which has its roots in Greek. This kara shares with the English word character, the meaning of, letter, of a letter, symbol, personality, nature, or dramatis persona. This is the first type of kara. The second type of kara is a specialized term coined by the manga critic Go Ito. This word formally takes the form of kara and is never expressed as character. In my own words, I would summarize this second type of kara as referring to the patterns by which a manga character is drawn. For example, it is thanks to this kind of kara that we are able to understand the manga and recognize that a dramatis persona depicted in various drawings is the same one. The second type of chart has been cited by researchers in various fields and applied more broadly to, anal to analysis of human beings and society. But not a few of these have been cases of overtly uh, broad interpretation based on misunderstandings. When I pointed uh, when I pointed this out, Ito posted a sympathetic tweet with me on Twitter. The third type of kara has appeared recently in Japan based on the first type of kara. Uh, this type of kara is not a specialized term coined by researchers. It is an everyday term that originally Japanese people particularly those of younger generations have begun to utter recently. According to the sociologist Fumiaki Senuma and the linguist Irena Sudanovich, appearance of this type of kara started around the year 2000. Although the word character can be still observed, it is more common to say this shortened form kara than to say character. So what does this third type of kara mean? Before answering this question, let us first confirm the meanings of style and personality to avoid any confusion. Let's, let's consider style first. For example, one might observe a Japanese business person asking a customer in a polite style, please see what you can do about the matter while bowing, and then asking a subordinate casually with a pat on the back, I'm counting on you too. Uh, this business person would not be ashamed to have a subordinate witness uh, this, polite, uh, this polite way of speaking to a customer. There also would, not be, uh, would be no problem if the customer were to observe the casual way of speaking to the subordinate. This business person is merely adapting the style of speech flexibly. In this way, whether the other party is higher or lower in status, people can intentionally and publicly change their own style of speaking. 
a change in style is a change in the word in the words people utter. It is not a change in the people themselves. This is why it is acceptable to change style of them. While style may change in a bewildering fashion depending on the circumstances, personality, uh, personality has more stability. A dramatic change in personality might be a sign that the speaker needs counseling as a symptom of the pathological condition of dissociative, dissociative identity disorder. Since it is very difficult to present a real world example, we will consider one from the world of fiction. This is a brief excerpt from a short story by the novelist Toshio Shimao. It depicts the change in the personality of the wife Nasu during marital spat. Nasu starts by saying in standard Japanese, I was wrong, don't leave. I apologize, please don't leave. But then she begins to speak in the dialect of her, of her home island, saying things such as Amma, which means mother, and Amma Iwanda Katerichitabore, which means mother take me away. Finally, she returns to the, uh, standard Japanese. Did I do something? What happened? Well, where am I? What is this place? But as can be inferred from these utterances, she doesn't recall what she had said earlier in her iron dialect. This is a case involving personality as a fundamental part of a person. Personality changes with memory and language. Normally, people are not able to change their personality intentionally. A change in personality is something that takes, pl takes place unintentionally. So uh, how does this third type of Kara differ from these concepts of style and personality? Let's consider some examples of young people worried about changes in Kara. We will look at three posts from the internet. This is the first post. Here, the author knows uh, this is not a case of consciously trying to change her Kara, but, uh, but that she cannot control it. From this, uh, we can judge her change in Kara to be unintentional. The same is true of this post. The poster notes that her Kara seems to change on her. Appearance of uh, the Japanese influential term yo, corresponding to English, English uh, scene, shows that the change is not truly made in self awareness. In addition, uh, since uh, she writes the Japanese phrase teshimau, which can behave a negative image at times and describes uh, how she was, uh, how she has been worrying constantly about it, we can judge this change to be unintended. Uh, we can say the same about this post as well. The change, the change in poster described in this post is not in intentional. Uh, this is clear because she describes when she meets with the other members of a certain group of people, she activates the Kara of an elder sister or a queen-like Kara, noting that she herself do, uh, does not understand why this occurs, uh, writing the Japanese term Nazeka or somehow. It also is clear for, uh, from her comment this is a source of so many problems that she doesn't des desire to make this change. As seen in these posts, uh, these three posts, the third type of Kara is a part of person, part of a person that changes unintentionally, uh, separate from personality. Uh, from now on, my talk will concentrate on the third type of Kara only. So I will no longer differentiate it from the others by explicitly identifying it as a third type. Let's compare Kara with style and personality. As we have seen, style is some, uh, something that people can change public, publicly depending on the circumstances 
for example, by switching between a polite style and a casual style of speech, depending on who one is speaking with. A change in style is merely a change in words of utterance, not a change in the speaker himself or herself. That is, the concept of style concerns people's words, not the people themselves. On the other hand, as we saw in the examples of a marital quarrel, personality is a fundamental part of a person that usually remains stable. A change in personality is a fundamental change, change with effects on language and memory. Kara is positioned in between style and personality. Like style, Kara changes with the circumstances. But like personality, Kara refers to a, person, a part of a person. People activate Kara suited to the circumstances, and those Kara behave in appropriate uh, styles. Indeed, Kara doesn't differ from style or personality in the sense that it serves as a, as a kind of regulator for, uh, for people to adapt to various circumstances. It can be likened to the way the elbow joint, together with the wrist and shoulder joints, uh, controls the movement of the human arm, the style, cara, and personality all can be described as regulators for people to respond to the circumstances. I believe that uh, like style and personality, the people in any society will have care. But, uh, but the in, uh, extent to which the regulator is explicit varies among individual societies. While this is merely a broad generalization, I believe that people in Japanese society often change their care but for this reason, do not change their styles very much. The uh, psychiatrist, uh, Tamaki Saito, uh, who holds that since the 1970s, uh, cases of multiple personality have become more common in the United States and less common in Japan, argues that Japanese people may be less susceptible to split personality because they frequently change their, uh, their character. This probably could be likened to uh, Japanese people lessening the load, the load of their shoulder joints by frequently moving the elbow joints. So why, uh, so why do posters of the three posts we saw earlier worry, worry about their own color changing with the circumstances? This is because each of them is aware that their changes in Kara are not socially acceptable. It is because of this awareness uh, that they have no choice but to grumble about their worries on the highly anonymous internet. Our society is based on promises. This means that uh, if I make a promise right here and right now, I will need to carry it out in the promised place and on the promised date, regardless of the circumstances. People would not be trusted if they changed unintentionally with their circumstances. Traditionally, such a society has been receptible to a view of humanity premised on intent. Uh, such a view holds that uh, people behave intentionally to achieve their, uh, their aims. According to this view, all of people's social be uh, behavior, including speech, is sometimes intentional for which they can be held responsible. Now let's imagine a person whose behavior under, circum under certain circumstances has changed from his or her behavior under other under other circumstances, according to a view of humanity premised on intent. Uh, this person's changes also must be understood to be intentional. Uh, that is, this person either is changing his or her style or is performing a false personality. In either case, the change is some, uh, something that the person controls intentionally. It is not a change in the person himself or herself. 
Of course, there is a possibility that the person is not simply performing, but is experiencing a case of dissociative identity disorder. But that clearly would be a pathological case. This view of humanity holds that aside from such cases, people will remain unchanged. Please know that under this way of thinking, people's character are not considered to be unchanging, but are thought, in fact, not to exist at all. As good citizens who keep our promises and expect others to do the same, this view of humanity premised on intent is the most natural view of humanity possible. But whether it is a good view for researchers to take must be, uh, might be a different matter. Let's take a look at what some researchers have said about young people worried about changes in their care. Researchers who now have defended such young people, but their argument has, uh, has been that it is not a bad thing to conceal one's personality intentionally, depending on with whom one is interacting. Researchers have not been able to address the young people's concerns about unintentional changes in themselves because they have treated it as an issue of intentional camouflage, probably because they have trusted in a view of humanity premised on intent. You might think that this issue concerns only the, uh, only the three posts we looked at earlier. Accordingly, I conducted a survey to see whether what these posts described was something specific to the posters alone. This survey was conducted online in July and August 2021. Uh, response, uh, responses were collected from 30 South American immigrants of Japanese descent, 153 native Japanese speakers, 149 native Japanese speakers, and 40 native Chinese speakers. The webpage was available in Japanese, English, Chinese, uh, Portuguese, and Spanish. The respondents were uh, shown each of the three posts and asked whether they had ever felt similar. They were asked to choose one of five possible answers. Uh, choice number one was, I never, feel, I never feel as described. Number three, I sometimes feel as described. And number five, I always feel as described. Choice number two was in between one and three. And choice number four was in between three and five. But there was no time limit on, uh, on completing the survey. And respondents were free to revise their answers later. The percentage of respondents who choose answers number three, four, and five, uh, that is uh, those who reported at least sometimes feeling as described in the three posts were too high to be ignored. Uh, this corresponds to the red text in this text. While the numbers were uh, low for the queen-like chart, uh, in the group of hot spring spans, which uh, post three, uh, which concerned an ex extremely specific case, a majority of respondent uh, South American immigrants of Japanese de descent sympathize with post one and two. Uh, even among ordinary native speakers of Japanese, English, and Chinese, the results were similar with at least 30% of respondents choosing uh, answers number three, four, and five, with the exception of post three. So uh, what are the implications of these survey results? These results imply that the feelings uh, described in these three internet posts are not extra extraordinary. Regardless of native language, the number of people conscious of unintentional change in themselves with the circumstances is too large to ignore. People can change with the circumstances in everyday activities, 
even aside from pathological cases such as dissociative, dissociative identity disorder. This changeable part of a person can be referred to using the term adopted by the young people who were the first to come out about the quality, Kara. Uh, while the traditional view of humanity premised on intent, which sees uh, changes in people's social behavior, including speech as necessary, in, necessarily intentional, may be desirable for us as good citizens who, keeps, uh, who keep our promises to each other. We should reconsider whether or not it is desirable in our roles as researchers. researchers. Let's revisit the, the issue of ego identity and care. This is the same slide we saw in the introduction. I do not argue against the idea of previous research that young people see themselves as a mixture of fragmented Kara rather than an ego identity. However, the term Kara used here doesn't refer to a dis disguised personality as they intended. It refers to a part of a human being that changes unintentionally, unintentionally other than personality. At the same time, we should know that young people definitely are not satisfied with this self-image as a mixture of fragmented care. This is clear from the internet posts we have looked at. Why does the ego identity has a, have the power to attract young people even though it is illusory? The answer probably is because it is well fitted to the view of humanity premised on intent, in which we believe as good citizens living in a, uh, in a society where we keep promises. Next, uh, let's consider linguistic identity. Here, our attention will focus uh, similarly uh, on the validity of a view of language premised on intent. Uh, this view holds that linguistic acts as a type of social behavior are intentional and purposeful. It also holds that language, fun language functions as a tool that, uh, that people use to achieve some purpose. And people will choose to use the language best suited to their in uh, intended purposes. <laughs> For these uh, reasons, uh, for these reasons, we can describe this as an uh, instrumentalized view of language. Language, like the view of humanity premised on intent, we consider earlier, uh, this view of language may be easily acceptable to us as good citizens, but this is not necessarily the case in our role as researchers. To begin with, this view of language is considered problematic as an impediment to linguistic diversity. This criticism, criticism holds that if language are considered tools, then the numerous languages around the world that are in danger today with ex extinction could be left unprotected as mere tools that are inconvenient to use due to low levels of compatibility. One example of this criti critique is the, the argument of the linguist, uh, Osahito Miyaoka. I would argue that an instrumentalized view of language premised on intent not only impedes, impedes uh, linguistic diversity, but also introduces limits in terms of the speaker's identity. It is widely known empirically that language is related to the identity of the speaker. This is an excerpt from Junichiro Tanizaki, uh, Junichiro Tanizaki's novel, Sasameyuki. This passage describes how, even though the character Sachiko Makioka from Osaka is quite capable of speaking Tokyo dialect, when speaking with a Tokyo woman named Mrs. Saga, Sagara, she made a special effort to speak in Osaka dialect, 
because to speak in Tokyo dialect seemed shameful to her. Sachiko also was shocked to see her friend, and Mrs. Uh, Nifu, who also was pre uh, present in the conversation, speaking fully in Tokyo dialect to match that of Mrs. Sagara, even though Mrs. Mrs. Nifu usually speaks in Osaka dialect. Tanizaki describes how, to Sachiko's eyes, uh, Mrs. Nifu on this day seemed completely lacking in her usual suavity and somehow to have become suddenly vulgar, even in the way she used her eyes, the way she pursued her lips, and the way she holds her index and middle fingers while smoking a cigarette. As this example shows, uh, in our everyday lives, what we say may differ sub substantially depending on the language or dialect in which we say. But this is an example from a note. Let's consider a survey conducted uh, to see if such an instrumentalist view of language based on intent introduced limitations on the speaker's identity. This is part of the same survey we saw earlier. Uh, but since the questions as, uh, assume that the respondents spoke more than one language in everyday life, uh, the number of respondents were uh, smaller than before. I used these uh, two questions. Question one. Are you ever told by family or friends that you seem like a completely different person when speaking one language uh, compared to whom you speak another language? Uh, question number two, do you yourself feel that you seem like a different person when speaking one language compared to when you speak another language? Respondents who answered in the, in the affirmative were asked further to describe their, speci uh, their specific uh, changes that they experienced. While the results differed somewhat, somewhat by native languages, native language and differences in family history, such as an immigrant background, a considerable number of respondents choose answers number three, four, and five. Thus, the number of respondents who answered that the change that they changed with the language spoken, whether this was based on the, the observations of others of themselves is too high to ignore. When uh, respondents were asked to describe the changes freely, many of their descriptions didn't seem to represent uh, intentional differences in use. From this uh, survey, from this survey, it would appear that people themselves may change unintentionally when changing the uh, the language they speak. This part of uh, this part of a person that changes unintentionally can, as we saw earlier, be described as a character. Uh, this leads to the need to reconsider the instrumentalist view of language based on intent which doesn't accept the existence of care. The social linguist Robert, Le, Robert LePage uh, described language as an important tool for indicating, expressing, and asserting one's own identity. I think that this is an excellent description. I have nothing more to add to it regarding the relationship between language and identity. All, uh, all I would like to say is that language itself is not the truth. The sociologist, uh, sociolinguist uh, Andre Bekish has pointed out that Chiara is closely related to Pierre Bourdieu's uh, concept of habitus. Habitus referred to the way, certain th uh, the way certain thoughts, speech, and behavior may become impressed on an individual through everyday experience. The idea that uh, different thoughts, speech, and behavior may become impressed on people in individual linguistic cultures or circumstances such as school or work would appear to agree with our survey results. 
many of the free description of descriptions of changes uh, mention the voice, uh, facial expressions, or body language. Respondents reported that these two changed uh, when they spoke different languages. So what have researchers said about people's speech? The field of speech science defined the term paralanguage to refer to the tone of an uttered voice. And according to many representative speech scientists, uh, this is considered to be something in intentional. Uh, this concept may be appropriate for analysis of controlled vocal utterances made in an experimental laboratory environment. But surely we should uh, eliminate the restriction of intentionality, at least when analyzing every, uh, everyday vocal utterances by multilingual speakers. The same may be said uh, regarding pragmatics. Various theories have been proposed concerning the uh, intents of the speakers and the hearer's uh, process of inferring the speaker's intents. But it is not the case that all aspects of all utterances are intended by the speaker. Uh, pragmatics doesn't appear to be concerned with these uh, this unintended aspects. It always starts from the speaker's intention. I'd like to show the deficiency of this idea by using examples from our uh, everyday communication. But uh, since it is difficult to present real world examples, I will return to the novel Sasameyuki to look at an uh, anecdote concerning two men. The first of these two men is named uh, Okubatake. This passage describes Sachiko Matioka's dislike for him. Uh, the, the reason why is because Okubatake intentionally shows, uh, uh, slows his speech rate, a type of paralanguage to make him seem uh, as, as though he is an unhurried son of a distinguished family. Even though he has uh, suffered a downfall, Okubatake is in fact a son of distinguished family, and Sachiko knows this. There would be no problem with Okubatake's leisurely way of speaking if it were a natural reflection of this status. Sachiko dislikes Okubatake and considers him unpleasant because he speaks this way intentionally. The next man we will consider is named Shokichi. Shokichi is a former servant of Sachiko's family. Hearing that Sachiko's family had been victims of a flood, Shokichi was the first to rush to the scene from a distance. After seeing that everybody is safe, he speaks in a voice that sounds as if his uh, nostrils are clogged, seemingly choking back tears of relief. But to Sachiko, this seems to be nothing but an intentional attempt to show off his devotion to the family. So or is paralanguage something that necessarily will be controlled intentionally at all times? Even grammarians are not unconcerned, uh, are not unconcerned by this argument. It has been said from the time of Hisatane Okano 120 years ago through the contemporary research of Satoshi Kinsui and Takamasa Nishida, as well as my own research, that in Japanese words spoken will uh, differ considerably with the character image of the speaker. For example, in Japanese, uh, the word for the English furthermore, shikamo, would be spoken as uh, shikamoyo, with a rising intonation by a speaker whose character image is that of a woman. Shikamo da yo, with a rising intonation and a copula da, by a speaker whose image is that of a man, or uh, shikamoyo, with a rising and falling intonation by a speaker 
whose image is that of a Bhagavan. What we here call the character image of the speaker corresponds to Kara. Since the speaker doesn't choose intentionally which of these to employ, they are not styled. And since the, the, uh, the change doesn't result in loss of uh, memory, and in the, as in the case of split personality, they are not personality either. Research on this character, uh, this uh, research on this character utterance is uh, continuing. But it is regrettable that most of this research concerns uh, utterances appearing in works of art, such as novels or anime. This is because the unintentionality of Kara in such utterances is conceived since they were uh, devised intentionally by the authors. But don't we need to look at real world utterances as well? Instead of focusing sorry, of, uh, sorry on exceptional utterances appearing in works of art, to which the instrumentalist view of language based on intent fits well. My lecture today can be summarized in four points. The first point is that there are limits to a view of humanity premised on intent. This is because of the difficulty, difficulty of establishing an ego identity that extends above and beyond uh, various circumstances. Human beings may change their character uh, uh, unintentionally with their circumstances. Like personality and style, Kara is a kind of regulator for people to adapt their circumstances. It is more susceptible to change than personality, but less so than style. The second point is that even so, the view of humanity pre uh, premised on intent cannot be ignored. This is because people are not satisfied with seeing their own personal images as mixture of character. This is because as good citizens who keep our promises and do not change with the circumstances, we are receptive to a view of humanity based on intent. The third point is that there are limits to an instrumentalist view of language based on intent. The people's character may change with the language they are speaking. To human beings, language is not a tool, rather it is more a part of themselves to which they have become physically accustomed. And the fourth point is that uh, there is a need for disciplines that study human beings and language to reconsider the tacit assumption of intentionality. Uh, this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Sadonobu. And now, uh, intentionally or unintentionally, we have to think about a lot of very heavy philosophical and linguistic problems, but I think it's worse because if we we consider this concept, we have a very bright future in thinking in a new way of society and language. And now I would like to hand over to Hannah Dahlberg uh, to start with her presentation. Thank you, uh, Professor Eshbach Shabo. Uh, let's see if I can get my slides pulled up here. There we go. All right. Um, so hello, and thank you to Professor Sadanova for his fascinating presentation. Uh, my name is Hannah Dahlberg Dodd, I'm a project researcher here at Tokyo College. I'm a sociolinguist by training, and my research is predominantly focused on the representation of language and media and how consumption of media interfaces with language used by media consumers. So I would like to begin a bit by talking a little bit more about Professor Sadanova's 2020 monograph, uh, Communication to Gengo ni Okeru Kyara or uh, characters and communication in language, upon which uh, much of today's presentation is based. Both in his book and presentation, Professor Sadanobu elaborates on the concept he refers to jointly as keran kerakta, an aspect of human interaction and communication that exists somewhere between a simple style shift, right, and a much more complicated personality shift. 
As he's discussed today, there are a couple of different conceptions of kera and kerakuta in Japanese, including the actual appearing character in a fictional work, uh, or just its blurry, flattened representation as put forth by Ito 2005. For my commentary today, I would actually like to pull the focus out a little bit from strictly Japanese linguistics and situate Professor Saranobu's conception of kera and the broader range um, with the broader range of approaches um, to capturing the relationship between language use and the self. So in English language sociolinguistic research, to my knowledge, there's not an exact phenomenon that's referred to by the word kera or character, uh, at least not one that does the same, you know, the theoretical work that karakta and kara do. So for that reason, I'd like to depart a little bit from the exact term character uh, and introduce a couple of other ways we can think about this relationship between language and a kind of imagined figure uh, and how these images can be donned and discarded uh, or in some cases change inadvertently depending on the situation. So a lot of current English language literature in this area finds its origins in Russian critical theorist Mikhail Bakhtin's writings on what he refers to by the term heteroglossia. Uh, looking specifically at his 1934 essay, Discourse in the Novel, Bakhtin uses this term to describe another speech in another's language, serving to express authorial intentions, but in a refracted way. In other words, Bakhtin is speaking of the use of language stylistics on the part of the author in a way that allows for multiple distinct voices to inhabit a single text. These styles, which he broadly refers to as voices, uh, cover a wide var variety of speakers, ranging from the kind of style used to characterize someone in a given profession or role, such as a, uh, what he refers to as a social voice, uh, to something as minor as disambiguating between different characters within a narrative, um, which he calls individual dialects or individual voices. Interestingly, in Japan, linguist Kikuzawa Sueo was speaking contemporaneously with Bakhtin about a concept he referred to as iso or phase, a term that was borrowed from the area of physics in order to account for Kikuzawa's observation that different linguistic styles could be observed depending on certain characters of characteristics of the speaker, including age, gender, um, occupation, and so forth. Drawing inspiration from Bakhtin's writings is linguistic anthropologist Asif Aga, who expands on Bakhtin's characterizations of voice and stylistics beyond strictly written prose and uses it as a way to talk about different speaker actors that are constituted through linguistic form. Uh, he divides the concept discussed by Bakhtin into three main categories, contrastive individuation, biographic ind identification, and social characterization. He defines contrastive individuation as largely a voicing contrast, or in other words, a style stylistic shift that can be put to work um, in a text as a means of differentiating among characters. So not you know, strictly character speech in like a flamboyant or loud sense, but um, more like a difference in how people or characters speak at an individual level, um, more of an idiolect sort of thing. Um, biographic identification, on the other hand, is primarily a grammatical phenomenon referring to the embedding of one speech in another's by means of personal dyxis. So for example, she said, I don't wanna go, uh, compared to she said she doesn't want to go. The final one, social characterization, is the one that best applies to styles in which there exists an indexical link between linguistic features and social characters. Aga 2007 refers to this phenomenon elsewhere as uh, characterological figures, uh, images of personhood that are performable through a semiotic display or enactment, such as an utterance. Importantly, Aga elaborates that a figure, once performed, is potentially det um, detachable from its current animator in subsequent moments of construal and recirculation. In the context of Aga's discussion, this emphasizes that characterological figures are essentially guises that may be donned and then discarded with the completion of one's narrative or interactive goals, um, at least in the case of spontaneous discourse. On the subject of detachability, Japanese linguist Senko Maynard uh, also stresses its importance in her conception of character speak, specifically with regard to what she refers to as fluid orality, a term that she says may be best understood as polyphonic speech initiated not by an ideal autonomous speaker, um, but by a multiple and often shifting interplay and overlay of speaking selves as characters. In her discussion, she takes a broad approach to character speak in and of itself, stating that it operates most prominently as an indexical sign in the Persian sense. She uses the term in a manner that allows it to cover anything with at least some kind of expressive meaning, uh, ranging from more widely recognized semi-formalized styles, such as those um, that involve stereotypical gender or dialect-related variation, 
um, to more ephemeral role-based styles, like what she calls the cool character or cute character. Um, uh, in her research, this uh, character speak uh, lens was developed specifically for engaging with fictional or fictionalized language in popular media, while serving as a vehicle for deepening our understanding of the speaker as a speaking person. So while this is certainly not an exhaustive summation of the frameworks that attempt to tackle how linguistic variables come together to semiotically construct a kind of character or characterological figure, um, each of these frameworks attempt to account for different parts of the speaker, sign, and signify relationship. Thinking specifically about Professor Sadanobu's 2020 monograph, his engagement with the implementation of Kata and the anxiety around their unintentional deployment makes his approach unique. Other works that have either oper um, other works previous research have either operated on the base assumption that enactment of a kata or a similar construct is intentional on the part of the speaker, or intentionality was just outside the scope of that study. Um, some of interpersonal reaction interaction, however, is at least somewhat unintentional, um, even if you know we don't really like to imagine otherwise. We become engrossed in conversations and let slip information or opinions that we don't intend to. Um, or we become different people around one community, such as at home, versus another community, um, like your work persona versus your home persona, without consciously deciding to do so. Professor Sadanobu's data demonstrates a direct engagement with that anxiety, uh, demonstrating that the enactment of kata in spontaneous conversation is not always intentional or voluntary, and that this is a facet that should be taken into consideration in this area of research. So to open our discussion, I would like to begin by asking about this anxiety, uh, specifically in terms of the survey results that you presented. Uh, so my first kind of big pile of questions, I guess it's just kind of multiple related questions, um, is given the anxieties that some harbor around having and utilizing multiple kiara, there seems to be a sort of, how, how do I put this, sort of fetishization of authenticity. Um, where you're not your true self, you know, whoever that is, then somehow that you're being disingenuous. Um, what does this mean for people who are multilingual? Do you think it's possible to maintain a sense of so-called authenticity uh, and remain intelligible cross-culturally? Is it, you know, technically possible to be the same person in English that you are in Russian, for example, without there being cultural confusion? Um, or is it necessary to kind of localize your personality, your not, not personality, localize your kata <laughs> in order to, um, as a part of the process of acquiring another language? Uh, my second question, relatedly, is relates to the manifestation of these kata from the lens of second language acquisition. Do you think it's possible or necessary for instruction about developing? Um, a voice in a second language be part of that education, not necessarily like on purpose developing that voice, but you know the idea of having a different voice in a different language be a part of your second language acquisition process. Um, do you think it would benefit that process, um, or if it would be detrimental, if it would just wouldn't really do anything at all? Thank you, thank, thank you very much for uh, reading my so carefully and listening to my lecture so carefully. Thank you very much. And uh, I received two questions, right? And the first one is uh, 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 you were asking me about the, the resource of anxiety people feel. No? Mm. Yes. Uh, I think uh, I think uh, the reason for anxiety is uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, concerned with the second point of my conclusion that uh, uh, it is uh, the, the reason is uh, the view of humanity premised on intent, intent uh, is needed in uh, still in is needed in contemporary society uh, because uh, our society is based on promises mm. uh, which uh, 
is that uh, we are requested to uh, be stable mm -hmm. uh, throughout uh, various circumstances. So uh, keep our, uh, the intent is very important to keep ourselves un unchanged through uh, these uh, circumstances. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the young uh, people, especially young generations, uh, 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 feel anxiety because they uh, lack such an uh, uh, intent. Mm -hmm. They lack such a power to uh, keep themselves uh, stable. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the resource of anxiety, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. It's okay? And the second, uh, your second question is, uh, is concerning uh, studying language. Mm. And uh, uh, I think uh, to study a new language is to create a new self, mm. uh, to create, uh, to uh, create uh, a new habitus in a, a new environment of that language. And, uh, uh, under uh, under uh, in instrumental in instrumentalist view of language, uh, nothing changed uh, uh, except uh, language. It's just a tool, but uh, in fact, <laughs> as uh, the result of my uh, questionnaire survey indicates, people change in accordance with the language they speak. Mm. So uh, study a new language is a very uh, adventurous, adventurous activity. I, I think. This is my answer. Mm. Thank you very much. Mm. I could ask a, a follow up question. Um, okay, we have a little bit of time. So the last question. <laughs> okay, sure. Just start. <laughs> <laughs> just, just a little follow up question. Yeah, sure. um, I was wondering, uh, Professor Sadanobu, how do you feel that your kara differs between your English speaking self and your Japanese speaking self? Or do you feel that there's a difference? I, I've uh, when uh, speaking, uh, when, when I speak in English, I feel I as I was as if as a child. <laughs> <laughs> totally different from uh, my original uh, Kara. Mm. But uh, uh, since I am a, a good citizen, I don't want to talk about Kara uh, Kara <laughs> uh, anymore. Uh, I, I think, yes, yes. I, I think uh, I don't believe uh, there is camera. Uh, <laughs> there is uh, personality and styles. That's all. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for both of you for this very interesting presentation and discussion, bringing us to really uh, fascinating topics of language and identity and intentionality and that we can continue discuss this discussion. We hope that everybody who was interested will join us at the next lecture. Thank you very much.